Hey everybody, welcome to session 3.10. Uh, we're going to talk about projecting revenue and some basic tools for that. We're, I want you to be able to explain the difference between real and nominal dollars and calculate real, real dollars. I want you to be able to calculate elasticity of revenue compared to something like GDP. And then I want you to be able to project revenue using a basic projection model that I'm going to show you. So uh, let's talk first about real versus nominal dollars. To illustrate this, I'm going to pull some numbers from the March of Dimes. Uh, so a pretty big nonprofit. Uh, they work on um, scientific research and health practices to prevent birth defects. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to pull the, the financial information from three years worth of 990s. These go from 2003 to 2005. I know this is pretty old, but the reason I'm using them is because they sort of help me demonstrate a cool principle. What we pull from those 990s for each of the years, um, um, the majority of March of Dimes revenue comes from public support or donations. And those are the numbers for each of those years um, that they got in public support. So you can see from 2003 to 2005, there's pretty steady growth um, in their public support. Now, before we get to calculating um, real versus nominal dollars. I want to introduce a rate of change calculation. This is really simple um, arithmetic to kind of track how much something changes over by a percentage over time. And so you take the later value, value 2, subtract from it value 1, the original value, and then divide the result by value 1, and that gives you the percentage by which something has changed. So if we take, for example, the public support numbers for March of Dimes from 2004 to 2005, well, that's 206 million minus 201 million divided by 201 million. And that gives us a growth of 2.73%, or so basically 2005 support is 1.0273 times what it was in 2004. Um, if I do this, the uh, same calculation for the 2003 to 2004 numbers, uh, that rate of change is, is just barely over 6% <clears throat> for that time period. Okay, but there's a problem. And the problem has to do with nominal versus real dollars. And here I'm using an example of 3% of inflation. When we talk in terms of nominal dollars, nominal it means in name only meaning that they're only dollars because it's got dollar because the dollar bill has one dollar printed on it but the economic value of that dollar is actually the real value of the dollar and is going to change over time so in terms of nominal dollars a thousand dollars from one year to the next stays the same but in terms of real dollars your money in 2005 is worth more than it's than it is in 2006 and that's because of inflation and the United States has had pretty steady, low rates of inflation for a long time. And will probably continue to have low rates of inflation for a long time. But still, inflation tends to be somewhere between 2 to 4% in the United States. Um, and, uh, and so what that essentially means is the value of your money, if you don't do anything else with it, you don't invest it, you don't put it in a savings account or anything like that, the value of your money degrades or shrinks by 2 to 4% every year. Now, it, a nonprofit would ideally have its revenue growth beat inflation because if your revenue is not growing faster than inflation, that means your revenue is actually shrinking. Tracking inflation for nonprofits is kind of tricky because there are different inflation measures used in the United States. One of them is called the CPI, that's the Consumer Price Index, and that tracks changes in prices. Um, for consumers. So, uh, you know, the basically what happens is one of the Fed offices will track, they, they sort of have what they call a basket of goods, things that people typically buy, and they track changes in prices of those things over time. And then it creates an, an aggregate inflation measure, which, like I said, tends to be around 3%. The PPI is the producer price index, and that's a basket of goods based on what producers buy. And the IPD is called the Implicit Price Deflator, and that is actually a measure for government agencies, so the types of things that government agencies typically buy. Nonprofits don't fit cleanly into any one of those categories, um, so if you're not sure which inflation measure to use, 
probably the best one is where the revenue comes from for the nonprofit. So if you rely heavily on donations from the public, you would use CPI. If you rely heavily on um, on like corporate grants, you'd use the PPI, and government grants, you use the IPD. Okay, now um, let's go back to March of Dimes. Because here's the thing, the nominal value is not the real value, right? The money loses its value over time because prices go up by two to 4% every year. And so the way you would calculate real dollars is you would divide the nominal value by the change of CPI from one year to the next. <laughs> and so basically when CPI is reported, it's reported as what's called an index number. And uh, that index number um, is only important because it's compared from one year to the next. And so if you look at the difference between index numbers from one year to the next, that gives you a sense of how much inflation has gone up. I'm not going to dig too deep into this because there's an easier way to calculate all this. But if I were to do the calculation, I took 2005 um, public support for March of Dimes, but then I compared it to the CPI change from 2004, the prior year. Um, those are what num those are the numbers I would use to calculate it. And what it means is that the real value or the indexed value of those of the of the March of Dimes reve uh, public fundraising revenue is actually 199.78 million. So so they have 206 million in revenue in nominal dollars, but only 199 million in real dollars based on a 2004 year comparison. And what that actually means then is that 2005 support was actually lower than 2004 support in real dollars. But I want I want you to imagine if the board of directors ever actually had that conversation when the CEO of March of Dimes reported the annual financials to the board of directors. Do you think that CEO said, um, "Hey, we actually have less money because in real dollars our our our, our fundraising shrunk"? Or do you think instead the CEO said, "Hey, we've got 206 million versus the the uh, the 201 million we had the year before"? It was probably the second. the The CEO probably talked about how they grew their fundraising by five million dollars, when in reality the economy or sorry prices were growing faster, such that the real dollar value of their public support shrunk. Now. I didn't give you a really super detailed explanation of how to do this calculation using CPI numbers because there's an easier way. And if you go to this website, bls.gov, you can find their inflation calculator. And here you can enter in the amount of any current dollar value and compare it to an index year. And so here I compared December $2,005 to December $2,004, and that gave me the same calculation as if I had done it by hand with the CPI numbers. So when you calculate CPI, this is a much easier way to do it. Uh, or sorry, when you calculate real dollars, this is a much easier way to do it because this little widget on this website does all the math behind the scenes. It looks at the CPI index numbers for you so you don't have to worry about it. Um, you know, this is actually kind of a fun toy to play with. Like you could compare your salary, for example, to a salary that you had in 2000, you know, 2003 or whatever. You, you can go years in, uh, into the past with this. Um, and so uh, anyway, that's the, the it's important to me that you understand the concept of real versus nominal dollars and that you see how you could quickly calculate it. But I don't care if you you know, use the actual CPI numbers or not, then do it by hand. Okay, so that's real versus nominal dollars. Dollars decline in value over time on average, and so it's important when you're comparing numbers that you compare them by real dollars rather than nominal dollars. Okay, now we're going to talk about elasticity. Elasticity is a measurement of how two things change over time and comparing the two. So it measures how one thing changes as some other thing changes. And we're using percentage changes as the basis for this. And so, for example, you can use an elasticity measure to compare revenue to the economy. You can, you can look at how a nonprofit brings in its revenue as compared to the economy. The purpose being if there is a projected growth for the economy of 3%, if you knew the elasticity measure for revenue to the economy, 
then you'd be able to project revenue according to a 3% growth in GDP. And it's not going to just be a 3% growth in revenue. GDP and revenue may not grow at the same rates. And so knowing the elasticity is how you know how much one thing grows as long as another thing is growing. And the truth is the same could be said for shrinking, but we're going to get into that just a little bit. So the reason a nonprofit should understand its elasticity, the elasticity measure of its revenue to like the economy is so it can plan for times of plenty and scarcity. Calculating elasticity is pretty easy. It's just one rate of change divided by another rate of change. If you remember when we just reviewed a rate of change calculation, it gives you a percentage change um, as you know, of, of one year versus the next. Um, here, we're just taking one rate of change and dividing it by another rate of change. What this does is it gives us a number that, the, and the way an elasticity number works is in the following ways. If it's greater than one, it's what we would call highly elastic. And so if, you, if your revenue was highly elastic relative to the economy, it means as the economy grows, your revenue grows even faster. Unit elasticity or an elasticity of one if, the, if your calculation produces a 1, then that means it's unit elastic, which means it changes at the same rate. So if the economy grows 3%, your revenue grows 3%. And then finally, if, if your elasticity measure is less than 1, it's called inelastic. And that means, as the econ in the case that we're using here, as the economy grows 3%, your revenue grows by less than 3%. And that number can actually help you calculate the exact rate of change. So if your elasticity was 0.5, for example, that would mean as the economy grew 3%, your revenue would grow just by 1.5% or half of the growth of the economy. So, so that's how, uh, and the same would be true for highly elastic. So if your elasticity measure is 2, that means the economy growing by 3% means your revenue grows by 6%. Okay. So, oh, and I forgot to say, negative elasticity numbers mean that they move in opposite directions. So if you have a, a, an elasticity of negative one, that would mean as the economy grows 3%, your revenue declines by 3%. So we could take the March of Dimes numbers and calculate elasticity for this time period, 2004 to 2005. So we have the on the top we have the public support and that's in millions of dollars and the bottom we have GDP that's in trillions of dollars. It's okay that I'm using different units as long as I'm using the same units on the top for all the numbers and then the same units on the bottom for all the numbers. Um, but basically the point is, is I'm tracking a rate of change for public support versus the versus the GDP or the economy for that year. And what that tells me is that year the measure was 0.399. Now, the elasticity measure is going to change from one year to the next, so you would do this calculation across multiple years to, to get a better sense of what the true elasticity is. But basically what is, this tells us is that as the economy grows, public support in March of Dimes grows by, by basically 40% of that, and 0.399% uh, of that. And so what... The, what the, sorry, 39.9% of that. And what this all means is that March of Dimes shrink, like overtime does not grow as fast as the economy. And that might explain why they're not beating inflation. Because as the economy grows, March of Dimes donations don't grow. And so what we're actually describing here is an organization that relative to the economy is smaller and smaller every year. It's not shrinking like going negative, but because it's not growing fast as the economy, it's not keeping up. And so on a relative basis, it's smaller. Now, you can use uh, uh, elasticity calculations on a per-revenue basis, not just for all total revenue. You can actually break it into revenue groups. And this is important because nonprofits that rely too heavily on one source of revenue can be at high risk. We March of Dimes is shrinking um, on a relative basis year after year because they rely largely on this one revenue source. <clears throat> and and you, you face risk better if you diversify your revenue sources. If you have a lot of different ways to bring money into your organization, then as some things grow, other things shrink, but it all kind of balances out to an average, hopefully, that keeps you alive and healthy. And so what you could do, for example, is calculate the elasticity for each of the revenue sources 
and then you weight it by by the percentage of total revenue that that that, that revenue source constitutes. So I pre-did a bunch of math here, but I basically calculated the elasticity of public support to the economy, the elasticity of government grants relative to the economy, and the elasticity of earned income relative to the economy. And now I'm weighting each of those by the percentage each each revenue source is of total revenue. 94% of, of March of Dimes revenue comes from public support. 5% comes from government grants. 1% comes from earned income. Um, what you can see is that the government grants and their earned income numbers are actually negative, which means they move opposite to the economy, but only slightly. But um, that gives us a portfolio or total elasticity measure, total elasticity measure of 0.395, sorry, 0.359. And again, what this means is on average across all the revenue sources, March of Dimes is not growing as fast as the economy, which means on a relative basis, they're really shrinking. Now, we're going to talk about these questions. Is it valuable to do this over a short history? The quick answer is no. I want to talk about how you might use this information if you're a nonprofit manager and what other types of com comparisons you want to make. We're doing elasticity relative to GDP, but you could track the elasticity of one thing versus another thing using all kinds of measurements. So to practice this, you could take any of the 990s that you're working on for your project and you could calculate the elasticity of their public support or any other revenue source for that matter compared to GDP based on the following GDP measures that I wouldn't look them up for you ahead of time. And so uh, you track the, you remember it's one rate of change divided by another. <clears throat> so you might track 2015 versus 2016, that change of nonprofit revenue versus GDP change over that time period. That's going to give you an elasticity measure. Or you could skip all the way from 2015 to 2018, and that would give you the average elasticity across all of those years. Okay, so. Uh, let's talk now and just wrap up by talking about how you would use this to project revenue. When nonprofits project revenue, they typically break out their revenue categories. And so one of the things they do is they look at all their large repeat donors and they ask themselves, okay, what sort of gift do we expect from this large repeat donor? They'll look at any of their earned income and they'll track that and predict what revenue they're going to get from that. They will include in their projection any new gifts that they expect. So if they're planning or hoping to land some large donation, they might include that in their projection. Any investment income would be included and any special events would be included. There, we could have more categories in this or we could have fewer depending on the nonprofit, but these are just examples of revenue categories that a nonprofit will use. And the reading did a good job of kind of walking you through how you would do that kind of a projection. So using the reading combined with what we talked about today what you would do for your paper, for example, is you'd project a low high range of revenue informed by the following things. First of all, what trends do you see in the changes in revenue for these organizations over time? That's one of the reasons you have three years worth of 990s is so you can look at three years worth of changes. You'd also be able to calculate the elasticity relative to the economy so you can see as the economy changes, how do these revenue sources change? And that elasticity measure will tell you how to make a prediction for the years coming up. And then if from an annual report or from their website or anything else, you have access to any relevant details that are specific to the revenue sources in question, you can include the effect that those specific details would have on the revenue projection. They won't tell you this in the annual report, but if you're running a nonprofit, you might have a foundation reach out to you to say, hey, because of the economy, we're not going to be able to fulfill our grants, our projected grants for the coming year. Well, obviously, that would affect the way you project your revenue as a nonprofit. And so you look at trends, elasticity, and relevant details, and that's how you can predict sort of a low, high range. Um, like what's the lowest you expect and what's the highest you expect from this. Um, and then you can, and my advice is generally go with the low projections. Um, there's a lot of guesswork to this. And if you feel uncomfortable because it's not like one exact right answer, that's okay, because that's the way revenue projection works at all levels in any organization. Um, you know, we try to apply a lot of science to this, a lot of prediction. Governments use a lot of um, revenue projection when they're trying to predict how much tax revenue they're going to get from their various tax sources. And the truth is, there's a degree to which it's educated guessing. And that's okay, as long as it's educated. 
and as long as decisions are made in a way that aren't reckless. But it's better to use an educated guess than to use a sloppy guess or no guess at all. And that's why we're learning this skill together. I will say this for your assignment. Um, you're going to lack a lot of the information you need to go into great detail. You're not going to be able to do a revenue projection the way you would if you were actually running the nonprofit. So just do broad categories, broad projections, sorry, for any of the major revenue categories, the kind of revenue categories you can read in the 990 or the audited financial statements. And you can still use trends and elasticity measures. If you find any relevant details that might influence your projections, include those. Again, I realize that you're guessing, and that's okay, as long as it's educated guessing. I'll also say this, don't, when your revenue projections, don't project using the current downturn that we're, in the, that we're at the front of right now. Um, there's just too much we don't know about what this, what this current recession is going to look like. We don't know if it's going to be V-shaped or U-shaped. We don't know how quickly we're going to recover, in other words. And so, and we also don't have any sense yet of how deep it is. Um, and so instead you can just, when you're doing your revenue projections for the coming year, you can assume a GDP growth of about 3%, which is what we've been close to, uh, some years slightly above and some years below, but you can just assume a GDP growth of 3%. Okay, so that's it on, on projecting revenue, and I look forward to seeing you all in class.